of course uh, start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which we are all gathered throughout Queensland and Australia and encourage you all to introduce yourselves in the chat. Let us know who you are and where you're coming to us from and uh, let's all get to know each other. If you have any questions during this panel talk, you can click the Q&A button, make sure it's sent to all panellists, type your question in and we'll be sure to answer that. If that function is not accessible to you, you can send us an email, undercoverartist at accessarts.org.au. Okay, so thank you for joining us today for this conversation number two, leading in collaboration. I would like to start by introducing some of our guests and asking them to introduce themselves. So I'll just go in the order that I can see on my screen here. Um, Rachel, would you like to pop your video on and introduce yourself? Hello, everyone. Um, Rachel and Mickey Hain, and I'm a not firing. I prefer preference is she to her. I'm a white buckle person in her mid 30. I have a long orby hair that pulled up with a black brain glasses and wearing a black top and I have a tattoo on my left hand side. I'm getting I'm getting down dreaming from the hallway in my home in the city of Brisbane on traditional land of Kurubu and Jagawa people. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you for being here today. We really appreciate it. Um, next up on my list, on my screen here, I've got Associate Professor Bree Hadley. Bree, how are you? Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Bree Hadley. Uh, I'm a white woman with uh, brown hair. Um, I'm wearing glasses. Um, uh, today I'm wearing a dress which is uh, black and red and yellow and orange flowers. Um, and I noticed as I was watching earlier as Alexandra Ellen was giving us a sneak peek of her work that I'm wearing the same dress she was, um, which is obviously completely deliberate because, you know, whenever in doubt, do what Alex would do. Um, I am coming from my house. Um, my background is a delightful brown curtain a delightful white wall and a little sort of corner of a painting that's red with just the nose of an elephant. Um, uh, and I'm coming also from um, Mianjin, Brisbane on the land of the Cherubal and Yagra people. Yay. Thank you so much for joining us, Bree. And um, Alex, if you're still with us and watching, I hope you feel honoured that you are the trendsetter of the day. Um, next up, the wonderful Dan Dor, who is joining us from the UK at an ungodly hour. Dan, are you awake? How are you? Uh, yeah, hi, uh, Dan speaking. Um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm awake, I'm here. Um, uh, it's really good to be here, actually. Um, I'm, um, my pronouns are he, him, his, and I've got uh, Auburn Mohawk um, running down the centre of my head, and it's at a length at about a number three or four. Um, I'm wearing a black uh, short sleeve T-shirt, um, and both of my arms are tattooed. Uh, I've got a, a goatee and moustache, um, which is also auburn or ginger. Um, and both of my ears are pierced and spaced. They've got silver tunnels in them. Um, I'm, uh, I'm in my home in Birmingham, uh, UK, in our lounge room against a, a, a plain white wall sat on my sofa. Wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us and for waking up early for us. We appreciate it. Um, I'm going to start just by um, prefacing for all of our attendees that this panel will be done 
as accessibly as possible. So if you need the captions, um, you can toggle those on and off. Let us know if you have any trouble with that feature. You'll notice we have the interpreters as well. We have them spotlighted. So you shouldn't have to do anything but if the interpreters disappear for you, let us know and we can help you out. I'll also ask all of our wonderful panelists to start by identifying themselves when they speak. So, you know, Maddie speaking and then continuing with their um, opinion or perspective and closing off with that's the end of my thought. We'll do that to avoid crosstalk and make sure everyone is heard. So, I'm so excited for this conversation. This one's all about leading in collaboration. What does disability-led or deaf-led mean in a creative process and project? And I'm sure we're going to have some juicy uh, anecdotes or, or opinions to share. So I think I'll just throw it out there and I'll start with you, Dan, if I can. What does disability-led or deaf-led mean? Uh uh, Dan speaking. Uh, to me, disability-led means um, having having autonomy or control over a space um, I am holding, um, and, and it's quite an important space to hold uh, because there aren't many of those in the world. Let's be honest. Um, um, so it's a, it, disability led allows me to be my best self um, and to concretely say what I want to say as um, unapologetically as I possibly can. Uh, end of thought. Thank you, Dan. Uh, the word unapologetic really sticks out to me. I'm just going to carry that with me. Um, Rachel, mind if I toss it over to you? I guess for you, what does deaf-led creative works, what does that mean for you? Rachel speaking. I actually do not like the word disabled-led or deaf led which is such a superficial wording, especially when politics is getting involved or the power or the dynamic, the, the ego that's getting involved. It's just so that the people who themselves identify as deaf led or disabled led tend to be on top of everyone else. And it's not it's actually no collaboration or it doesn't show the actual collaboration between these people. And sometimes when I go into a disabled like organisation, and I have no respect for other disabled people or deaf people. So for me personally, in changing that way, I prefer to use like collaboration or deaf collaboration or disabled collaboration and create it where they have to full control of everything they can create. Thank you, Rachel. I knew this panel was going to be a juicy one because we have such a broad spectrum of thoughts and ideas. Um, and I certainly have opinions of my own, but that's not my job here. I'm a facilitator here to help the conversation happen. So I would like to throw it to Bree, if I may. Um, Bree, what are your thoughts on the notion of disability or deaf led um, as a concept? Free speaking. Um, my first thought is you've just thrown down the challenge for us to pull you out of the speaker, the facilitator role, so we can work on that. Um, I have multiple sets of thoughts. Um, uh, I have thoughts thinking from kind of an industry and researcher point of view and thoughts from a personal point of view. Um, I think I agree with Rachel. I think there's power in the concept though, um, because the concept points to who's got the decision-making authority um, and we exist for better and worse in a context where um, other people have had 
the choices over the art and not just the art of deaf and disabled people for a long time. And so there's, there's um, usefulness or leverage to be had um, in a concept of having decision-making authority in the hands of deaf, disabled, a number of terms that we could apply. I think there's also um, a personal meaning to me um, as somebody who perhaps has worked in a lot of spaces that are more mainstream. Um, and there's a resonance there of not every disability led space, but the best ones, the ones that function um, in terms of best practice, um, that there's a, a, there's, a, there's a comfort there. There's a sort of an almost coming home there. There's an ease there. There's an ability to let go there sometimes. Although, as I said, I would agree with Rachel that not all of them. It's not the end of my thought. I've got plenty more I could say, but we'll leave it there for now and see what evolves. <laughs> Thank you, Bree. Dan has a contribution to that one. Dan. Uh, uh, Dan speaking. Um, yeah, it's getting juicy already. I love it. Um, and, and for me, it's down to like needing to really uh, unpack what leadership actually is and looking at how do we lead, how do we perceive leadership and, and kind of the way I like, I really, really understand your points, Rachel and Bree. And but I have to say, when I lead spaces and a lot of spaces that I've led, it's not at all, there's not really a hierarchy there. There is a collaboration and every decision is a conversation. It's not because my body is so damaged by hierarchy and societal hierarchy, I don't do it in my own work. So that's why disability-led practice resonates so strongly for me, because I can lead and hold people in a way that 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 we that people need to be held. And I'm I'm taking on board everybody's access needs, everybody's wants, desires, that does not happen in society. Our governments don't listen to what we need ever. They never have, and they probably never will. And it's about acknowledging that and realizing that that's probably going to always be the case in our lifetimes, sadly. So it's about for me, as a disabled leader, taking back that control and go, okay, how can I care deeply for the people I work with rather than being a, a leader, a leader that comes with an idea and, and that, being, that being the way, I would say, end of thought. Gosh, I love this conversation already. And um, it's not going to be hard to draw me out of my facilitator box. I might have to share an opinion real quick. Um, I think I've been thinking about this a lot since I've come into the role as festival director and what does disability led mean in this space. And I've really personally felt that my job isn't actually about me. It's about the community of people that I'm supposed to be in touch with as much as possible and, and you know, advocate and represent for the community's best interests, not my own. And that sometimes means sacrificing my own creative opinion or aesthetic, but, you know, that's okay. Um, I would love to throw the opportunity out to all of the audience. Um, you do have the capacity to send anonymous questions. So if you're feeling like you've got a prickly question, you can send an anonymous question through the Q&A function and we can get to those at the end. I'm particularly interested in hearing from deaf and disabled artists on your personal take around what disability-led or deaf-led means. 
but I'd love to hear from some non-disabled and hearing um, creatives who might be attending as well. Um, what are your thoughts, concerns, questions? Let's just dig right into it. My next question for you, I'm going to throw it to Brie first. And Brie, this is going to be a challenge to answer in a short, succinct way. But you've done a lot of work on allyship in disability um, arts context. Could you give us a brief overview on what an ally is in a disability-led space? Allyship is something that is more than a sentiment and more than a kind of thumbs up like the campaign. Um, allyship is kind of a series of reflections that help you understand the kind of structural basis of oppression um, and become partners with somebody to work in collaboration to change the system. Um, to, to bring us to a changing of the world almost. Um, and allyship is something that works in multiple directions. Um, so allyship is something that in a disability arts context needs to operate not just between non-disabled person and disabled person, because that binary is false, um, because we're much more diverse than that. Like even those of us on the Zoom in the picture boxes are really diverse. Um, and then we also have other intersectionalities in terms of uh, gender, sexuality, race, class. That wouldn't be succinct if we got into that. Um, and then we also have issues with our allyship. And this goes back to what Dan was just talking about that for some of us, the long history of oppression that, that we live in our bodies enables us to be good leaders in a disability-led space and not do the thing that we have experienced. But for some of us, we can flip to the dark side and we've learned so much about how to kind of um, wield power that when we want to get away in a collaboration, we do what's been done to us. Do you know what I mean? So allyship is something that is multiplicitous, if you know what I mean. And I think that leads right back to what Rachel's talking about at the very beginning about um, disability-led practice if it's to be useful, deaf-led practice if it's to be useful, is something we need to, to have it as more than just a word. It needs a basis in good allyship and how we use mechanisms of good allyship to build trust and respect grounded in disability cultural principles and shared kind of vulnerability and reciprocity between all of us in the space. I don't know if Rachel would like to pick that up. That's the end of my thought. I will throw it to Rachel because I think she's signing yes at the moment. Rachel, what are your thoughts or responses to what Bree just shared? Um, do you want to put me to spotlight? Rachel speaking here. On top of what we were talking about, um, I have a lot of, I have a lot of many different topics where there's both allyship and a real allyship, especially when there's not um, enough deaf or disabled um, technical team. And that's where you need to develop the allyship with um, non disabled or hearing people. Some if a weird, real relationship happen is where that absolute respect and empower our deaf and disabled decision making. They give up the power to control all that. Where I have quite a few both relationship where they say, yeah, yeah, I work with deaf people. I love deaf people. I learned some sign language and they went to a club, but they take the full control and then to you compare in above us. So yeah, you can like to take with it back classic when it comes to creative work. It needs once we have that foundation of that best classroom, then we can continue to develop a high quality work with those great alliances. Any more thoughts? 
Thank you, Rachel. And also thank you to everyone because you're making it easy. I don't actually have to keep answering questions, asking questions. You just chime on in there, makes it nice and easy. I might just leave and leave you to it. No, I won't. Um, I would like to um, present a provoking question to you, Rachel, if I may. So you've shared um, some of your um, feelings that, you know, disability-led and deaf-led can be quite an oppressive environment still um, or harmful if the leaders aren't necessarily working within best practice. Um, We've also heard across the panel already this notion of, well, the oppression that we've faced in our own, you know, past experiences has the capacity to make us good leaders. I'd love to know, Rachel, what what you think the benefits of a deaf-led process are or um, a disability-led process and if you can identify how, how to reach that from a place of, you know, feeling negatively in the past about these processes? Uh, frankly, I think we need to unpack though with an ideology because it's very well ingrained in everything that we do. And I've got like me. Oh, well, many you need to got like yeah. Um, sorry, Rachel here. I'll say it again. Um, I think firstly, we need to unpack the recognized ideology that ingrained in our practice and the cultural practice, really. Because at the moment, we're seeing the hierarchical, like Dan said before, hierarchical approach is happening everywhere. Where they say it's get led or get leadership once they're in the top position, but really, they're in a technical position. Doesn't mean they have a great leadership. Because at the moment, when I look up, they're actually a great person to make decisions for deaf or disabled people in our industry. Not really. So I think we need to unpack what that is first and then try to work out like the best practice. How do I show my respect to such a diverse and disabled people? Some not in some not visible, some is you can actually see or you can't see. Because sometimes I don't know if the person has a disability, but they actually have a disability. I still have to give my respect to that person. You know, I can't we can't always continue making assumptions. Now, for example, I went to a, um, a workshop. They don't know how other disability, but they can't make you something because they have to make sure they have to provide such a safe space, which they didn't. You know, sometimes we need to have a best um, asset inclusion in our work, in providing services, in, in everything that we do. So that's the one thing I actually really enjoy when I was in, living in the UK. Is that they already have like the embedded, they removed the medical model, they embedded the social model. But here in Australia, it's so strongly focusing on medical model. At the point where I'm a little bit frustrating, and that's where the deaf led and disabled lead is coming from, where it should be coming from social model. And that's the most important part that we need to investigate more. Yeah, that's the end of my thought. I can see Dan and we might have something to say. Thank you, Rachel. Um, I have made a couple of notes here. I do at some point want to come back to the notion of assumptions and visibility um, in terms of leadership, but I would love to throw it to you, Dan, just because Rachel did reference the UK. Um, would you like to share basically your thoughts on what she just said or um, anything you'd like to contribute about disability-led and creative processes in the UK? Um, sure, Dan speaking. Um, there, um, yeah, there, there's a real, there's a real kind of shift here at the moment, and there has been for a while, um, ever since, 
ever since, well, particularly this year with um, Black Lives Matter and um, um, the um, Nothing Without Us, uh, Nothing About Us Without Us um, movement here in the UK. Um, so that's um, really gaining speed and it's really made me think on, on um, think about care and centering care in the work that I do and we do. Um, there are a couple of artists here in the UK who do that really well. I would say Claire Cunningham is one. Um, 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 uh, and, and they really center care in a beautiful way through the work that they that they do, and I just kind of li listening to Rachel talk, it, it it made me think of, I've always had this, I guess, interest in, in the way, the way the artist, whether disabled or not, is, where am I going with this? So, so my, my, listening to Rachel speak like artists were infantilized right we're, we're infantilized by arts organizations all the time um and that's before disability even gets into the mix and so so then when you're a disabled artist working with an organization, you are treated like a child. And, and, it, and, and for me, that's why, that's why um, dis disability-led and disabled-only spaces are so important because when non-disabled people come into that space or allies come into that space, um, you know, there's an understanding that they're, they're coming um, and they've done the work. And I think for me, allyship is um, a group of people who have done the work or are prepared to do the work. And it like, there's nothing worse than a non-disabled person coming to me and going, um, tell me everything about disability. And I, I now just tell them to Google it. Cause I'm just like, just do the research, do the work. But like, I've, I've just met, I've just met you. I don't know what's interesting for you. What do you want to know? Unless it's about my lived experience, I cannot help you, and that's a, that's that that's kind of allyship, and just and that that I get that kind of it's linked linked to expectation, and just because I've got CP, I I should know everyone else in the world who has CP. And, and it's this weird kind of expectation that non-disabled people have about the disabled experience. Um, yeah, so, so, that, so that's why allyship is so important because it's... That, that's how a non-disabled person can really care for disabled people is by doing the work. Because if I have to constantly do the work for you, that's exhausting because I've been doing that work my whole life. And, and I kind of sum that up by going, it's kind of because I'm always asked like, why why do I get so frustrated with with that situation 
um, with ableism. And uh, then so I try to explain to it in terms of it's like chasing an unpaid invoice every day for your whole life, chasing an unpaid invoice every day for 37 years. And that's the impact of ableism on my experience. So that's why allyship and doing the work is so important. End of thoughts. I love that analogy, Dan, chasing an unpaid invoice. And that really resonates with me. Also, I don't like chasing things because I can't run. So I just feel like I want to pop that there as another thought. I don't have the physical energy to do all of that work and the emotional labor as well. Um, but thank you for that. Um, I've just been scribbling notes the entire time and I've abandoned my prepared questions. So I hope you're all ready. We've heard a little bit about um, how we perceive leadership and what leadership actually is. And then um, Rachel mentioned, you know, needing to avoid making assumptions. Um, I think what I would love to know is I know for me personally, when I enter a disabled led space, even if I'm not familiar with the disabled or deaf person leading the space, I do feel a sense of relief and comfort that perhaps I am safe here. I won't need to chase that invoice in this room. Um, so I guess what I'm getting at is what is a good disabled or deaf leader in this space and what can they do to make sure that we do maintain that sense of safety and trust within a creative project? Um, does anyone have any thoughts on that? You can throw your hand up um, or I will just call on you like it's high school English class. <laughs> Rachel. Um, at some of the people who is great, you know, I've been involved in managing her project, two of them. Um, the first one was Paul, and that was the, one of the most um, interesting experience for me because I felt like I finally, like, uh, felt like I felt I was supported. I was able to help the people in the space. We actually respect each other. We empower each other. We support each other. And then that, when I knew that was a great disabled project to work with. And the second one was the same, 12 tables, Manny made sure she had it in Chaperone Bay. She made sure we all faced each other. That's because she knew what my need was before I went into Bay. And then she made sure everyone was comfortable. And that was a great um, um, theater plastic that we all include. I do the same thing for my previous project. We called um, Get Body in Space. Like I said, can't make this jump to because um, you have a lot of diversity in the deaf community. You have like completely deaf who fully sign, and then you have deaf all in signing, which is like me, and then you have deaf who don't sign but speak or learning to sign, and then you have kind of hearing. You have a very diverse community. Something about some sign in some Auslan joke. So you can't really make the something me Auslan for all. You need to fix it person when you come to space by asking them what their needs are, what their accessibility requirements, how can I make them comfortable in the space before they get into the space. So, yeah, I was very appreciative of the project. I was involved and I enjoyed my experience. That's the end of my thoughts. Um, I will cross you down. I just want to say thank you, Rachel. And just a note to everyone, I did not plant that question so Rachel would say nice things about me. That's not what happened, but I appreciate it nonetheless. Um, Dan, you wanted to uh, chime in there. Uh, Dan speaking. Uh, yeah, uh, Rachel, I couldn't agree more. Um, there's something, yeah, as, as I was saying before, something about the person-centred approach 
and that being deeply embedded in care. And um, I was struck by, um, I was making a piece of work with uh, the wonderful Claire Cunningham um, last year or over the past couple of years making this work. And um, uh, we, as part of the daily practice, we had an act, had a check-in um, to see where we were at, and then there was an access check-in, um, and, and and that gave us a chance to acknowledge that our bodies, are, as disabled people, our bodies are different every day, and therefore our needs are different every day, and it's this, this, this checking back in with, okay, what what do I need for myself today? And how can the people around me help facilitate that? Um, and, that and that was really refreshing um, because I found myself in a lot of instances where, where organizations in the past and people have worked with in the past have said, oh, but you said you didn't need that extra taxi or whatever. And so, like, oh, well, I didn't know. And they're like, well, you should, have you should have said that was your access requirement. I'm like, on the day I gave you my access requirement, that was not a need because my, my body was not fatigued. Whereas now my body, and it's almost like, and it's almost like, 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 kind of, and the response I get is like, it's like I'm lying to them or withholding information. And so I guess what I'm trying to get at, it's about in, in the processes, carving out time and space for those conversations to happen. And also having, having, taking the time at the beginning of every working relationship you have, whether it's in the studio, rehearsal room, office, wherever, having conversations with every member of the team to go, how do we all work best? What's your preferred method of communication? How, yeah, and, and having those conversations with the team and that's how you can actually get to know them and not, not, and kind of almost skipping the small talk in a way to launch and do, okay, what do we need and how can we care for each other in this space? Um, yeah, end of thoughts. Thank you, Dan. Thank you for that one. Um, I have scribbled some more, so bear with me. Here are my thoughts. Um, I wrote down when you mentioned nothing about us without us, um, and I think that that's really at the top of my mind when I think about disability-led processes and who has the right to tell what story and who owns that work moving forward. So if I'm writing a show about myself like Hold, which featured the lovely Rachel, um, then I have the right to take that story forth wherever. Um, but what does that mean for the non-disabled allies who also work on that show and what right do they have and, and what have you? Um, something else that you said, Dan, um, well, I've just written down the words dismantle the way we do things. And so you talked about setting up time for check-ins and developing relationships with people to really get to know them and what their needs may be. Um, something that's come to my thoughts is that I don't think we recognise enough that the way that our arts industry works is for the abled hearing standard. Um, and so it requires a lot of effort on our parts to chase several invoices at once if we think about the creative side of things as well as taking care of ourselves. Um, so in that word ramble that I just presented to you, um, 
the notion of nothing about us without us leads me to this potentially prickly question, which I would love audience members to respond to as well, either in the chat or anonymously in the Q&A function. What is the role of a non-disabled or hearing person in a disability-led or deaf-led creative space? Does anyone want to have a crack at that? Bree, can I call on you, please? You can call on me. Um, see, here's the thing. I don't think it's one role. Um, I think there's multiple roles and I think it's very context dependent um, uh, because um, the types of allyship are many and varied in the creative space. If, if you talk about allyship in other spheres of life, um, people will talk about um, the need to listen, the need to believe what people say, the need to let people speak for themselves. And that's very useful when we're talking about um, social forms of allyship and professional forms of allyship. But when we add the aesthetic into the mix, we've got other things going on. Um, the role of an ally with an emerging artist um, may be to offer a uh, kind of access and logistical support. It may be to assist with some of those um, check in, check out, bring people into the room kind of things and establish methodologies that work. Um, but as artists move into the mid career and things like that, the odds that they're going to want um, allyship that ascends into aesthetic domains may change. Do you know what I mean? Like the, the relationship in the artistic allyship may be different for a mid-career or established artist compared to an emerging artist. So I think there's more than one form and we don't have a language to articulate to each other what form of allyship we're looking for. And that may be part of the, the, the issue that brings sometimes problematic relations is that we talk about ally as though it's one thing and never unpack. And it could be that, that you and I, Maddie, Maddie, we want to do a process where we're allies to each other and we assume we mean the same thing, but we don't. And you mean you want support with access or support with process. And I mean, I want the ideological aesthetic stuff. And we're talking at cross purpose from the start. Does that make sense? Which is a poor place to end my thought, but there it is. Thank you, Bree. I think what I take from that is that there's a real need for transparency um, and really clarifying things from the outset with the relationships, the roles and the ways in which the creative process will be different depending on who's involved. Um, Rachel, do you have anything you'd like to add to that or any thoughts that have popped up for you? Uh, yeah, I think the role are uh, really clear, defined in the industry. It really defined it. Because that's when you know who has the power to make the decision. Uh, however, I have done projects where our voice was never heard and they had the power to go right above you and they compress you. Like, for example, I had to down to Donna. She went and changed everything. She didn't even follow what I did. That felt like I was powerless. How do I manage that? You know, that, because that person thinks she knows everything, but doesn't take on the concept or the idea thing that I gave her. So it's all, like, like I said before, it all comes down to alliance. The person who had the technical skill to do that role, without it, if they disabled, therefore hearing, they need to have, like Dan before, they need to do their homework. You don't want to be thinking the invoice to get paid. They need to do their homework. They need to um, get good back. They need to empower up to make the work. That's how that and the table artists can actually produce high quality by those people who can do that for us, not us doing that for them. That makes sense? That's the end of my thought. 
It does. It does. I think we have a raised hand here as well that has just popped up. Um, is that, oh, we've got, oh, no, the hands are disappearing now. I don't know how to feel about that. People feeling a bit like, oh, I have a, oh, no, I don't have a question. Yes, I do. No, I don't. <laughs> um, you please feel free to ask questions in the Q&A function. If you'd like to do it anonymously, that is the way to do it. Um, and I actually... Yes, I think I see an anonymous question here. Um, some people, okay, just finding a way to translate this. Some hearing and non-disabled people um, sometimes express feelings of hurt or exclusion when they see the terms disability-led or deaf-led. I would love to know what your response is to hurt feelings, I guess, from people who don't identify as deaf or disabled. Rachel, would you like to go with that one? Um, yes. Yeah. Well, especially with the word um, deaf led, I have quite a few people that came up to me and talked about that issue. That's why I set up um, a theatre company called um, Auslan Before Me Up, because I used the word Auslan, me, I'm inclusive of people who actually use Auslan, including like Coda, who is a young deaf adult or um, and, or sister brother who is deaf, because you have to maintain those relationships. However, like like this big discussion, sometimes deaf and disabled people need to have their own space to create the work because they're actually getting tired, including myself, getting really tired of their power of control by human people. So sometimes we need to draw that boundary say, enough, I want to create my own work. I want people to put my own work. I don't need to keep on going, keep on going with the big control power, that ego in the space. I don't want to get control in that. I don't want to be physically that. I just want to continue creating work that matches my needs. That's the end of my thought. That's great. Dan, I'd love to throw it to you. What are your thoughts? Uh, Dan speaking. Um, yeah, thanks for this question. It's a real, really important one, I think. It's like... It's like <sighs> It's like reverse racism, like it's not a thing and and non-disabled people need to stop making it a thing. You have the rest of the world and I, I'm not understanding why you're getting so hurt by me, by me not saying you're not allowed to come into a rehearsal room. Like that just doesn't make sense to me. And I would say that's your privilege possibly white privilege coming into play there um, because uh, white supremacy is um, linked to ableism. Um, so we need to acknowledge that here and now. Um, so yeah, I'm just like, it, I, I would say it's bullshit. And, and that, that really needs to stop because that's actually another, another way that you're oppressing us, end of thought. I'll ask the same question of Brie with the added little bonus question. Um, how do you feel about non-disabled and hearing people expressing hurt um, over being, quote, excluded in those spaces, comma, follow-up question? <laughs> what would you say to those people um, do you, do you think that those words have a place or do you think, um, do you think that it might be possibly another oppression tactic? I have, free speaking. Um, so I um, am in the fortunate position of teaching this stuff. So I hear many and varied views from many and varied people and have 
kind of ways of working through a bunch of this stuff and a bunch of versions of this stuff. And there's versions that are about um, hurt at not being able to lead the process, hurt at not being able to come into the disability only process. And we all know the one of why can I not play the disabled character? What's your issue? I'm an actor is another remix. Yes, Dan knows it well. I can see he knows it well. And I, it is related to the isms for me. Um, and the first thing I say, because when you're working with students, you, you need to be inclusive and inclusive means everyone in the room. Um, the second thing I say is we do need to relate it to the isms and the structural oppression. We are in a moment where people have experienced structural oppression and structural oppression is not I missed out on a role one time. Structural oppression is the whole world is making me miss out on the role all of the time due to my identity position. And we need to fix that. And if there comes a point in 500 years time when we have fixed that, then maybe we can let go of some of these things, but we're not there. We're still in the moment of structural oppression for people with disabilities, for people of color. And while we're in that moment, we need to have these, Dan, do you want to chime back in your, that's, that's the issue for me is the structural oppression creates the necessity of the disability led and to kind of get all uh, about it is denying that reality that that's the issue for me. So inclusion, including everybody, I understand people may not have the full grasp of the structural oppression as the issue. I would like to think there's a world one day where we don't have these issues, but today's world, we have them. And today's world, that's why we need the necessity of disability only space, disability led, the same as we need indigenous led practice. Thank you, Bree. I have just had a look at the time and we've been having a yak for about an hour now. So we've got two minutes left. Does anyone have a rapid fire thought that they'd like to close in on or a message that they'd like to send at all, either to disabled and deaf people watching and listening or to non-disabled and hearing allies in the space? If you have a final thought or some advice or words of wisdom, Dan. I, th I think as disabled and deaf people, we need to get better at calling out non-disabled people out on their shit. Um, um, because there's a lot of it that we have to wade through on a daily basis. And um, yeah, it's, it's about saying no and just going, okay, this person might feel a bit sad that we're not inviting them into their space, our, our space, but so you'll get over it, end of thought. Thank you so much, Dan. Bree, do you have anything, uh, last thought on that one? Oh, I have so many thoughts. Thoughts are not going to end. Um, can we have more conversations at a different time and keep going? Because it's all so valuable. Hear from more people in the audience. It's been fabulous. Thank you so much, Maddie and Dan and Rachel. No worries. Thank you, Brie. Rachel, do you have a last word you or two you'd like to throw in? Um, yeah, I have, um, like, like everyone said, I have many thoughts, but I'll leave you with big notes. Please start unpacking, though, recognize it the ideology, of the capitalism, corruption, and all that. And also, please uh, change your perspective from a medical model to social model when thinking about deaf-led or disabled-led art. That's all for me. Thank you, thank you, Rachel. Um, I've really enjoyed this conversation, and as everyone said, we've got a million more thoughts that we could have in the future. Um, is this something that you'd like to perhaps have a continuation of this chat at a future date? If we gather this group together again, maybe grab some guests. If any audience members have anything else on this topic that they'd like us to touch on, let us know because we might be able to do something like this again in the future. Um, thank you everyone 
uh, Anna Molnar just says, yeah, invite Sia. Um, it's very topical at the moment. Um, if anyone's not paying attention, just have a quick Google and um, put the non-speaking autistic voices first in that conversation. Um, thank you, Rachel, Dan and Bree for joining us here today and to our interpreter, to interpreters, Cornelia and Sue and captioner, Sandy. Thank you so much. We're going away for a quick break, um, but then when we come back, I'll be doing a quick closing speech and then we'll have a sneak peek into Undercover Artist Festival 2021 and a little bit of information on how you can get involved. Thank you, tune back in then and we'll see you soon. Goodbye everyone. Mm -hmm.